I read this morning from the letter to the Philippians. In the fourth chapter, I read verses 10 through 20. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I've learned that the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty, and of being in need... I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, how many of y'all are familiar with Marie Kondo? Everybody know? Maybe a few folks know better than others. Uh, Maybe you uh, recognize not the name, but the the concept. She is an author and has written a lot about uh, simplifying your life, about uh, purging your life from things that you don't need. Uh, This method she calls the KonMari method is basically uh, a way of, of looking at the stuff in our house uh, and deciding what we really need. Uh, according to this method, you, you walk into a, a, a space, uh, and she suggests doing this all at once, in a day or in a week or in a month or whatever it takes. Uh, and in this space, looking at these things and picking something up and saying, does this give me joy? And if not, get rid of it. You don't need it. Toss it out. And uh, by this method, then we're able to uh, uh, get rid of a lot of the stuff, to live more simply in our, in our homes, in our spaces. Uh, there, of course, our idea is that, that we have too much stuff that, that, that just kind of clutters up our lives. And so living simply uh, kind of gives us uh, kind of mental health uh, as well as cleans our house out. It makes it a, a, a safer, cleaner place to live. Uh, now... Uh, I've, I've not read any of her books, I'll, I'll admit, but I've, I've seen the concept and I've seen enough over the years. Every time um, I, I hear her or see her or read something from her, I have this thought. I wonder what Marie Kondo would say to my granddaddy. <laughs> you see, my granddaddy grew up in the Depression. My granddaddy is pretty much the, the polar opposite of the KonMari method. Uh, when he was alive, he, uh, he gathered things like his life uh, depended on it. Uh, they built a house in uh, kind of a small town in Illinois, and they, uh, they filled that house with stuff. Uh, so they, they built a patio on the back and built the patio and filled it with stuff. And then they, he built a workshop off of the patio and filled it with more stuff. And then a plant room over here next to the patio and a carport, those were all filled with stuff. So finally, he built what he called the boonie. The boonie was this huge Morton shed out back. And when I say huge, they pulled the RV into about a third of it and then put the boat in the middle third. And then the last third was filled with shelves and shelves and shelves of stuff. Stuff that he had collected over the course of the years. Now that he had more space, he collected more stuff and filled and filled and filled. You see, growing up in the Depression, um, he had lived in want and knew that that there would potentially come a time in his life when he needed some of that stuff. 
Uh, there would be something that he would want that, that thing for. And so there was all kinds of stuff. There were old bikes and there were old uh, tires all over the place. There were uh, just boxes and boxes of tools, fishing tackle. I mean, there's all these big boxes full of, uh, uh, you know, uh, lures and worms and all kinds of stuff. And just all kinds of, all over the place. This whole box filled with uh, clay pigeons that most of them were broken. He said, well, some of them aren't broken, so we'll just keep them all. Um, He's, he's kind of the, the anti-Marie Kondo in, in his, his gathering and his collecting of things. Um, now, the point of all this, uh, you know, because I can imagine this, this conversation between the two of them, right? I could imagine uh, Granddaddy and Marie Kondo uh, and, and Marie, Marie saying something to the effect of, well, well, this, well this, this, uh, this 30-year-old box of plastic fishing worms give you joy. And he would say, you bet your butt it does. Now put it back where I found it. <laughs> Because for them, they have different values in terms of what simplicity looks like, don't they? Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say in all this is that, um, well, simplicity isn't simple. Uh, there's a complexity in what things mean to us and what they do for us. For example, somebody like Marie Kondo might say, uh, it is obscene to own all of the stuff that we own. And I could see her point. Uh, the things that we collect, the things that we commu- uh, coll- you know, kind of accumulate over our lives, and, and it feels like it's immoral in some ways. Um, but my granddaddy would say it is immoral to give things away. It is wasteful. It is uh, ignorant. And it assumes that you'll always have stuff, which may or may not be the case. And so there's these different complicating factors the way that we, we think through our lives. I mean, imagine uh, us thinking about, oh, yeah, I have so much stuff, I have to give some away. Imagine how that sounds to two-thirds of the world that, that would love to be able to have some of the possessions that we have. Simplicity isn't simple. Um, and, and so as we open up the, the pages of Scripture uh, today, we, we see a, an example of that. We see uh, Paul writing to the, the church in, in Philippi. Uh, now, uh, apparently, uh, Paul has uh, been, uh, received a, a gift from them, some kind of monetary gift, some kind of gift of resources from them uh, through, uh, through a servant. Uh, and he wants to thank them for that gift. Uh, but you see how complicated that thanking is. Uh, I don't know about you, but the, uh, this, I think, is probably the, uh, an example of the worst thank you note ever. Uh, I mean, think about it. Here's, here's, here's Paul uh, wanting to thank them for the gift, but if, if Paul's mother told him, now I need you to go write a thank you note to the church of Philippi because they gave you all that money. Uh, and Paul wrote, walked into his uh, room and he sat down and he wrote a, a thank you note and he showed it to his mom and said, here, what about this? She would say, you march right back in there and you write a better thank you note than that. That's not thankful at all because basically what he says in here is, well, well, thank you for the gift that you gave, but I didn't really need it anyway. Paul's mother would have a fit, right? We, we don't thank people in that way. We don't uh, try to, uh, to make them feel guilty about uh, spending so much money on us. Like Paul almost seems to do. It, it's, it's, it's a complex message he gives. And I think the, the reality is he's trying to do a lot of things in this message to the church at Philippi. He's trying to, uh, to be thankful, to teach them about generosity, about, uh, about what it means to, to be uh, thankful when, when people give you something. But also it's a, a message uh, about simplicity. He's trying to say, and yet... Uh, the, the money you gave me, it's, it's not the biggest thing in the world. It's not that big a deal. Uh, and so there's this message that seems complex. It seems difficult to understand. Well, what is he trying to, to really say? Uh, so, so I would offer that there, uh, there are a handful of ways, a handful of things uh, that, that simplicity might mean to us. Reasons why we want to live a simpler life, why we want to declutter, why we want to uh, simplify uh, in terms of the stuff in our lives. There's several reasons. <laughs> One, well, simplifying will make your, your life richer. It will make yourself richer. You, if you're not buying the, the latest iPhone, if you're not getting the, the big fancy car, if you're not trying to, to build a house up on the hill, if you're, you're realizing, well, I don't need all of that stuff. I, that's not important to me. You're going to have more money, 
right? I think at some point that was, that was granddaddy's point. It's like, the, you know, I, you have to be able to, to prepare for the worst. You have to be able to prepare in case something goes wrong in life. Uh, so you have to uh, hold back. You know, sometimes we'll, we'll put these two words, uh, simplicity and frugality, next to each other. That one way to be simple is to be frugal. And so, uh, well, we can have more money if we, if we live a simpler life where we don't try to uh, uh, buy clothes as often or we don't... Uh, so there's, there's a, a reason for that, that, that we live more simply. Uh, but even in granddaddy's case, right, that doesn't necessarily... Just because he uh, maybe had some more money at the end of the day doesn't mean his life was simpler. I mean, he had to keep building more stuff to be able to fit it. And he became a, a wonderful organizer just so he could fit it all into, into that space. Um, is it really living life simply? Or here's another reason, uh, to make yourself happier. Here's Marie Kondo's suggestion, right? To say, well, you, you'll have a better joy, you'll have a better peace in your life if you don't have as much stuff, have as much attachment to these things, uh, which I get her point as well. I think there's some, uh, some wisdom there, uh, right? Because, um, you know, as soon as you have stuff, you have stress, because you're stressed about making sure you have the right stuff and making sure you uh, protect your stuff. And, oh, you've got to build a, a new thing for the stuff. And, well, now you've got to put a, uh, an alarm system on that stuff. And it, it becomes more stressful and more stressful. So why not even just get rid of it? It'll make you happier in the long run to not have all of that in your life. At least Marie Kondo would suggest. Or here's a third way. To, to make yourself more self-sufficient. So... Uh, this is what uh, Paul was kind of reacting, kind of in the, in the context of, there's a, there was a group of philosophers uh, called the Stoics. And you, if you know that word Stoic, it means to be kind of, to stay within yourself and to not uh, be very ostentatious or not very loud or boisterous, to be kind of Stoic in your, in your personality. Well, the Stoics believed that was the way you should live your life. Uh, that you should be self-sufficient, kind of within yourself, not, uh, uh, not out in everybody's face, not, not living with all these uh, loud and boisterous uh, ways of life. Instead, you're, you're, you're kind of within your stuff. You're, you're stoic, uh, and so you don't own a lot. You don't have a lot. You just kind of uh, move from, from place to place and from town to town, and, and you don't need to, to, to possess things. And, you know, again, there's a, some good reason for that. But, you know, um, what do you see in common between all three of those? There's this word right here in the middle. Right there, right there, right there. It's all about ourselves. How easy it is to focus on us. Well, well what will make me happy? What will make me richer? What will be, make me more self-sufficient? And I think that's part of the duplicity of simplicity, if you would. Um, because we're not quite sure as our changing notions uh, go from one side of the other to the spectrum. And so Paul says there's another way. There's another way to live, another way to, uh, to, to have faith. He says a, a fourth option. He would suggest instead of self-sufficiency, we should live out of God-sufficiency. Live with the understanding that God cares for us. Uh, again, if you open up the, the scripture passage, this is, this is all throughout this passage. Uh, here's, here's what Paul is really trying to get the, the Philippians to understand. Uh, yes, we could be thankful, but in the midst of that thankfulness, say, it's, it's not because of you. That's why his thank you note is a little bit sketchy, right? Because he's not just thanking them, he's really thanking God for their generosity. It's all about God's work. And that's why we, we see again and again throughout this passage, uh, He's able to rejoice. He says, well, that's what, that's what my life is really about. It's, it's this God's sufficiency, being content no matter what happens to me, whether I'm, I've been plenty or in want, whether I have food or I'm hungry. Whatever happens in my life, I will be content with what I have. Uh, not focused on self, not focused on me and, and, and my definition of what's important, but instead saying, okay, God has given me this. God will meet my needs. Through it. Uh, it doesn't mean God will pamper me. It's not what Paul is saying. I mean, remember, this is a guy we're probably writing from jail um, in the midst of beatings, in the midst of torture, in the midst of oppression. He's not saying, well, look, God will just pamper me. No, 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 no. God, he's not saying that to the uh, Philippians. Instead, he's saying, whatever happens to you, God walks with you through it. God 
cares for you in the midst of that. God cares for your needs. And so uh, here's the, the reality of a, uh, a verse that, that many of us have probably heard before, quoted many times again, uh, over and again. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, right? How many times have you heard that or seen it on a little plaque? Maybe you have it somewhere in your, your house. You know, this was a, an interesting passage to me. Uh, in a, a college, uh, Christian college, uh, this, this verse gets uh, heard uh, repeated uh, about 10 times a day. You hear it all over the place. Uh, you know, at least I did when I was in Christian college. Uh, you know, you hear folks that are like, oh man, I've got this, this big test coming up. So uh, 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 I don't know. I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if you can pull it off. And somebody else will say, well, don't worry. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So just don't worry about uh, uh, study and go play some more Xbox. You'll be fine. Or, you know, this, this girl in, the, in my, my bio class is beautiful. I want to ask her out. Uh, I don't know, though. I'm just a little bit nervous. Oh, no, no, no. you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So go ahead and go for it. It'll be fine. No, no, no worries. Uh, or I had a buddy that uh, was an athlete, and so he would... Uh, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, lift weights. And so that was his mantra as he was lifting was he could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I can lift more, I can lift more, I can lift, you know, higher and higher amounts. And, and, and basically, um, what that became then was an excuse to say, whatever you want to do, go ahead and do it because God's on your side. Uh, again, self-defined, self-focused. But the reality is, the point of that verse is not about, go ahead and do whatever you're going to do anyway, and just get God to bless it. Instead, it's not about, oh, whatever I can do. Instead, it's about God strengthening me. That whether my life comes with plenty or with want, it comes with uh, many, many uh, gifts and many, many uh, dollars and many, many uh, amounts of food or not. Christ strengthens me in the midst. Whatever I'm going through, I have my needs met. And, then, and so that's why at the end of this passage that, that I read there in verse 20, it takes this, this twist. All of a sudden, it's, it's like a doxology, just like we sang together, right? This, this praise, this thankfulness of, uh, to God. And the reason why is because what's happening here very clearly is, is Paul is trying to remind them, yes, I'm thankful for your gift, but I'm thankful because God has given it to you. Right? That's his definition of simplicity. Well, what did you say in the children's sermon, Fran? That gets to the heart of the matter. That's what Paul is saying. It comes down to saying, God is sufficient. Whatever my life looks like, God is sufficient for me. So praise be to God as he offers this doxology. And so here we are in our world trying to figure out, well, what does simplicity mean to us? Uh, and here's some, uh, here's some options. Um, but I hope Paul's message to us uh, rings true. Uh, that putting our faith, putting the sufficiency in, in God's hands and not in our own, that's what makes a difference. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about um, a, a master of the faith, a, uh, uh, one of the, the leaders of our faith, uh, one of the, uh, the loudest voices in, in creating uh, the Society of Friends, otherwise known as the Quakers. Uh, and that's George Fox. Uh, there's old George standing up on a chair preaching in some tavern, and he's got, he's got everybody's attention, right? He's got uh, all these voices, all these thoughts, all these eyes on him as he begins to preach. He lived in the England in the 1600s, uh, and, and in, the, in the midst of uh, basically a difficult time in, in, in a life of war and a life of, uh, of poverty, you know, here uh, George starts to receive these, these visions, these ideas from God that he wants to share with people, but he doesn't quite have the right uh, tools. He doesn't quite have the right, uh, and so they start to kind of uh, set him aside. He's not the right person for the job. Um, but Fox says, no, I have a word to share, and I'm going to share it. So Fox became this preacher, and he would just go from town to town. He'd go from place to place, and, and he would preach uh, the gospel. And, and oftentimes we associate the Quakers with simplicity because he would live this God-sufficient life. He would live this life of saying, hey, you know, it's not about the stuff that I have. It's not about my possessions. Uh, it's about understanding that God is providing for my needs and all the rest of it will get sorted out in the wash. So this morning, uh, just a, a couple things I'd like to share about 
George Fox, messages from his writings and from his sermons about how we might live maybe a more simple life. Here are some of the messages that, that Fox gave to those who would hear. Uh, he says, first of all, don't own things for the sake of esteem. I mean, this is a big deal for us, right? We want to get the, the right thing to look good. We want to make sure we, uh, we, we uh, have the right um, uh, kind of uh, ways that people look at us, right? We, again, are focused on kind of our, our self uh, image and uh, the ways that, that we are important. And so uh, he says, don't do that. Don't live for the sake of esteem. He, w- he was put down because uh, he didn't have the right degree. In his day, if you didn't have a degree from Oxford or Cambridge, you didn't matter, right? You weren't going to really be able to preach. You weren't going to be able to, to, to uh, speak the, the, the gospel truth. And he said, that's not the way it is. God speaks to all, right? I mean, this is, this is kind of in the same century as the Baptists are saying the same thing. Uh, and so it comes out of this idea of, no, it's not about esteem. It's not about what you have or what you look like uh, or your degree, uh, but it's about uh, what God has gifted you with. Now, here's, here's somebody, uh, full disclosure, who's getting ready to get another degree uh, in preaching, right? So from, 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 a, from a fine institution, right? So it's easy for, for me to be one of the people to say, well, yeah, 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 of course you need this, and you, all, you know, all of these things. But it's a helpful reminder from Fox to say the, the, the God-ordained life, the, the God-sufficient life says that's what you need. Your value comes in God's love for you, not in what you have, not in the initials after your name, not in your net worth, not in the car you drive. It's not about those things. It's about God's love for you. Richard Foster, who, who is a Quaker and is kind of in the legacy of George Fox, uh, has written a lot about simplicity. He's written, perhaps you know of uh, his book, The Dis- uh, uh, Celebration of Discipline, where he writes about different kinds of disciplines, including uh, a discipline of simplicity. And he writes this. He says, The Christian discipline of simplicity is an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. Because we lack a divine center, our need for security has led us to an insane attachment to things. We really must understand that the lust for affluence in contemporary society is psychotic, he says. It is psychotic because it has completely lost touch with reality. We crave things we neither need nor enjoy. We buy things we do not want to impress people we do not like. Ouch. Ouch, right? But it's true. We laugh because it's true. But to hear that and to know that is freeing, isn't it? To say, well, why why do I have to buy the new iPhone? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to impress people with, with the things that I have and the esteem around me? Because I know that God loves me regardless. God is sufficient in my life. Is freeing and powerful. Second point. Uh, enjoy things without needing to acquire things. This is a difficult one, I think, for us in consumer America, right? Because we hear again these messages of you have to buy, 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 buy. You have to have, you have to own, you have so on and so forth. Uh, you, you know, if you, if you don't have enough uh, tools, build another workshop to put them all in, right? <laughs> That's what my granddaddy would say. And, and so uh, how do we enjoy things without owning things, in acquiring things, possessing things, controlling things? Again, the the theology behind this is that God owns it all anyway. We're just borrowing it for a time. And Fox lived this way. Again, he went from town to town to country to country to continent to continent, came to the uh, Americas for a time to preach this gospel and didn't have stuff. He didn't have a lot of possessions. He just kind of lived like Paul, lived off what other people could give him. And so was thankful like Paul to folks like the, the Philippians, folks who would, would support him, would help him, would, would guide him in his work. He understood the, the joy uh, of, of physical things. He wasn't a spiritualist to just say, well, I don't need anything physical, right? Paul wasn't either. I understand the need of things in our lives, <laughs> but I also understand I don't have to own it. I don't have to possess it. I don't have to control it because I don't own it anyway. God is the owner of all things. And we enjoy things in our lives without needing to acquire them. Finally, appreciate God's creation. This is one of my favorite. Uh, 
Because so often in our lives, we, 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 we look at the things that we have, the, the lists that we cross off. Oh, I got one of those. Okay, good, good. I got one of those. Oh, I need to get one of those. Uh, in our own little world, in our own little walls. But when we step outside of that and we look at a hawk soaring up above the Kansas fields, or we look and, and see a sunset, or, or a sunrise this morning, and I, I got up early and I saw the moon and the planets and the stars starting to wink out as the sun began to rise. That happens whether or not I put it on my calendar. Whether or not I have a plan for the moon to be beautiful. The sycamore tree out the, the neighbor's backyard will grow and leaf out and be beautiful once again this year. Whether or not I have planned it. That's God's sufficiency. That's a reminder to us when we step out into nature and see, look, all of this stuff happens and doesn't require us to do it. God cares for us. It's why Jesus preached the parable saying, you know, God's taking care of the lilies of the field. God's taking care of the, uh, the birds in the air. Don't you think God's kind of got an eye out for you? And that's what Fox says as well. In his, uh, his letters, he was famous for writing letters to people, much like Paul. Um, here are these words that he wrote about, uh, about appreciating God's creation. He is the living God that clothes the earth with grass and herbs, causes the trees to grow and bring forth food for you. He makes the fishes of the sea to breathe and live. He makes the fowls of the air to breed and causes the buck and the doe, the creatures and all the beasts to bring forth whereby they may be food for you. He is the living God that causes the sun to give warmth to you, to nourish you when you are cold. He is the living God that causes the snow and frost to melt and causes the rain to water the plants. He is the living God that made heaven and earth the clouds, causes the springs to break out of the rocks and divided the great sea from the earth. He divides the light from the darkness by which it is called day and the darkness night and divided the great waters from the earth, gathered them together, which great waters he called sea and the dry land earth. He is to be worshipped that does this. He is the living God that gives you breath, life, and strength and gives you beasts and cattle whereby you may be fed and clothed. He is the living God and he is to be worshipped. Dwell in patience and peace and love and unity one with another. Be subject in power, life, and wisdom to God and one another that, it in, that in it you may be as pleasant field to the Lord God. And as the lilies, the flowers, and the buds feeling the pleasant showers and streams of life from the living God flowing upon you. Whereby the presence and blessing of the Lord God Almighty amongst you all may be felt. Or as the songwriter says, his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. May that be a reminder of what's truly important. That God cares for us. God loves us. That God is sufficient for us. May you feel the freedom and peace that that truth brings. For I know God watches you and me. Let us pray. God of perfection and God of clarity, God of hope and God of love, may we see the size of the mighty mountains and be turned in our hearts toward you. May we understand the tiny microorganisms that chew up a downed limb and know that you are at work. May we see in our lives and in our hearts, examples of your sufficiency. May we set aside the need to impress others because we know deep down that we are impressive 
to you. May that be our hope and our reminder in these days. And then we pray. Amen.